be really practical here tonight. In fact, we're talking to you tonight about taming your tongue. Uh, in James chapter 3, I want to read just the first five verses of this particular passage. Notice what James says. He says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that ye shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which, though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hemp, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little far kindleth. And uh, if I could for a few moments of time, I want to talk to you about taming the tongue. And uh, certainly any time that message is probably relevant, uh, in our age more so, you hear a lot of talk about gun control today. I've uh, been, been our president and many of the others have discussed it quite a bit, maybe because uh, there's a lot of killing, a lot of things goes on, and uh, they think maybe that you could control the gun. I think maybe you ought to try to control the people is what I think you ought to control. And, and uh, in fact, if you don't have guns, uh, we're not going to be very safe around here. But uh, somebody told me that I could relax and rest really easy because there was a lot of Packers going on around here right now. And so I rejoice in that very idea. Uh, somebody wants to come to Mount Nash, we're going to have cameras outside, and we got folks inside too, amen. Yeah, I don't think it'd be a safe thing for anybody to come here with anything on their mind, amen. But yet at the same time when we talk about uh, this gun control, I think maybe James did with something that maybe need to be talked about a little bit more, and that's tongue control. Amen. And so here's a problem that James deals with and how sometimes we need to learn to tame the tongue. Now the tongue is a serious matter. Jesus discussed it on several occasions. In one particular place, Jesus spoke about it and he said in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account of in the day of judgment. For by their words they shall be justified, and by their words they shall be condemned. Your words that you say carries a lot of pressure and power, and it's going to last for a long time, and it's going to be words that will come back to you one day at the judgment seat. In 1 Peter 3 and 10, the Bible says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him tame the tongue or reframe his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. The tongue is powerful and if it's not controlled, it can get us in serious trouble. We live in a day when, of course, there's a world of talkers and as a result, there's a lot of sin goes on and a lot of wrong. Uh, two of the commandments that we read about that God gave us to give us some rules for living was that they had to deal with the tongue. And that is, take not the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and thou shalt not bear false witness. Both of those sins are committed by the tongue every day in Whitley County. I mean, brethren, there's a lot of people need to get a grip on the tongue. I used to hear uh, the charismatic uh, friends of mine who talked about how that people needed other tongues. And I tell you what, I, and they're spiritual. I tell you what, I believe spiritual, it should control the tongue you've got. Amen. I believe if you're spiritual, it's because it comes out of you. You're straight. You're kind. You're, you're, the, you're the kind of person that can bring glory and honor to the Lord. And so beware about the tongue. In James 1, 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, he deceiveth his own heart, and that man's religion is in vain. I want to tell you, we need to have some tongue control. And so tonight, if I could, I'll share three truths. I want you to notice we must use them unselfishly and carefully 
and beneficially. Notice, first of all, if you're going to tame your tongue, we must use our tongues unselfishly. In fact, if you see it on the screen, look back at verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that ye shall receive the greater condemnation. Now the word there, masters, is translated, means instructors or school masters. Now James is writing to those who are interested on always getting up in front of people and leading people. To be able to be the limelight person and to be able to speak in front of others and try to give direction unto them. And of course, there was a lot in the Bible. Uh, many of those in the religious day had a deep desire for exactly that. In Matthew 23, verse 6 and 7, the Bible tells us, Jesus warned them, said, And they loved the uppermost rooms of the feast and the chief seats in the synagogue and the greetings in the market to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi or to be called a teacher or a master. And that's what they would talk, call them. And, and many of them would, would desire that place and get up and, and I think use their tongues. And sometimes I think when we communicate the word of God, it's very valuable and it's very important, but it always needs to be under control. It needs to be that we're there for the right Reasons. Notice again in 1 Peter 3 and 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one on another. Love as brethren, be pitiful and be courteous. I think maybe if we're going to use our tongues unselfishly, I think there's two things that James is going to bring to our attention. If I could, let me share them with you. He says, first of all, be careful about your desire. Now, James says, my brethren, be not many masters. Be careful about being a desire to be a master or to be a teacher. Some folks is always want to be up in the limelight, under these lights, you know. Some people has that desire. i be honest with you, I never thought I'd ever be under the limelight. I never thought I'd ever be in this position I'm in right now. And most people that knew me growing up never thought I'd be there as well. Amen. I know that. Uh, but it's not one of those things that I ever had a desire for. In fact, I never really could even give a speech. You know what? Amen. I never wanted to get up in front of nobody. Really be honest with you. He said, uh, crowds make me nervous. They really do. I mean, so, but, but some people, it seems like they always gravitate toward wanting to be under that particular light and to be up in front and to be seen of men. I think the reason of that is, is somehow or another they have a desire, and I think maybe that pride is in their life. Pride, it says they want to be seen. Pride says, I want to hold a higher position. Pride, it says, I want to be out in front where everybody can look and see me. Uh, there's a lot of sins that I can always spot. I can spot a person that's always in sin. If they're drinking, I would say that person is sinning. Now, I tell you, it seems to be on the contrary. A lot of people don't think that's a sin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, drinking is a sin. Now, you mark that one down. Uh, you know, or I can tell if someone is doing drugs, I am say that's pretty outward, it's pretty open, that person is sinning. If I hear someone and they're cussing and carrying on, I can pretty much say, well, I can see that man is a sinner. Or if I see someone abusing someone else or a child or, or a man, a woman, I can say that, that person's a sinner or he wouldn't be doing that. But while I can see a lot of sins, there's some sins in good people that you can't pick up on because of the sin that's in their heart. It's a sin called pride. And pride gets in and says, I want to be a master. I want to be a leader. I want to be out front. I want to be one of those who are instructing people. And the Bible warns us about that. It's when we just desire it and there gets to be pride down here. Now, I know somebody don't think the motivation of someone has anything to do with it. I think it has everything to do with it. Why do you do what you're doing? Why do I do what I'm doing? I ask myself all the time, why do I do what I'm doing? Is it for the money that they're paying me? <laughs> yeah, amen. Is it because I like the limelight and I like to be up in front of people? What's the motive I I want to tell you, friends, if it's not genuine, if it's not right, then you've got a problem because it's usually pride. It's for motive. Now, you remember the Bible tells us that when God looked down and was looking for someone to become a leader, and, 
and, and they come and they look on the outside and you remember the story is found in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 16 and verse number 7. And he thought he had to write one. And the Bible says, the Lord said, you look on the outside of man, but I look on the inside of man. While I see the outside, I can pick up on a lot of sins, but God can see the inside. And so the Lord looks on the inside. And sometimes pride is there. And I want to tell you, friend, that's a sin as well. The Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord God. I didn't say that. I just read a Bible verse. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 and 4, a high look and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Now, I, I thought pretty much I could understand a proud look and somebody's full of arrogancy and always got that, you know, I'm above you and I'm better than anybody else kind of look. Uh, uh, but what, what, where did you get this? The plowing of, of, uh, of this sinner uh, and, and the plowing uh, is wickedness. Well, uh, you know, when people uh, uh, as farmers and they don't ever think God gives them the rain, God gives them the sun, God gives them everything they've got and they think they're the one growing the, uh, uh, the garden or they're the one growing the fields or they're the one doing it all. I want to tell you it's a sin and God says it is. I want to tell you everybody that's doing anything, you ought to give God praise and glory. And so I used to wonder about that. I said, how in the world uh, can those people out there plowing ground, how is that wicked sin? Well, it's because they do not appreciate in the pride of their heart, they think they're the one doing it. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 6, 16 and 17, and there's a lot of sins God doesn't like, and one of them is a proud look. You may remember in 1 Timothy 3 and 6, the Bible says, not a novice. Don't lay your hands on a novice. Don't get a novice in a position lest they be lifted up with pride and he fall into condemnation. The devil will take advantage of people if they're not very careful to where pride goes to getting into them. And if you get a, a, a preacher or a deacon or someone who's holding a position, and if they're not very mature, in a little while they'll think their position is far above everyone else. They're untouchable. They have, no, they have nobody to answer to. And, and they get beyond all that. I want to tell you, when you get that big and you're beyond anything else, you're headed for a big time fall and you're headed for big time trouble. So not a novice, because a novice who's immature and can't handle the position and can't handle maybe success and they'll think they're in authority and they'll fall by pride. So notice what he says here. He says, be careful about your desire. My brethren, my brethren, be not many masters. But let me say also at the same time, because it gives direction. Notice, be careful about your desire, but notice it gives direction. If you look back at that verse number one one more time, I want you to note that the Bible says, My brother, be not many masters, knowing that ye shall receive the greater condemnation my brethren my good brothers and sisters he said, uh, because a teacher a master a leader of people will receive the greater condemnation the truth of the matter is a preacher of the gospel a pastor of a church a teacher of a Sunday school class a teacher in a one especially those who teach children someday they'll give an account of them directing the lives of those who are under them. I tell you, one of the great blessings, and I praise God for the Mount Nash Baptist Church, and I thank God for teachers who teach in the children's or any of our, ch our department or any of our classes. And, 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 and so it's my opinion that uh, through the classes here at Mount Nash, while I pastor the Mount Nash Baptist Church, every teacher here that's got a class is a pastor that I give a portion of my authority and a, a portion of my ministry to you that you might fulfill my ministry in your class and watching over those individuals just as a pastor does of the church. You help pastor in every class. And so it's important that we all be true to the Bible, that I be a Bible preacher and true and fundamental and that you are fundamental and that you teach proper because 
all of us who teach the Word of God and direct lives and direct people. And by the way, church, I want you to know that a teacher is a surgeon of the soul. And why doctors is so important and every move they make has got to be exactly right because it's so important to the life of that individual. And such is it true for a preacher of the gospel or a teacher as well because they're a surgeon not of the body but of the soul and they teach young people about what they believe. You know why we got such a liberal day? You know why we got an hour where there's no absolutes and when young people does not see wrong in anything anymore? It's because somewhere the teacher didn't teach them this is what God's word says now there's a different set of standards by God almighty for preachers and teachers and everybody else that's what that verse literally says right there because you're directing that soul and young people is going to find Jesus and learn the right truths and in their older years, they're going to believe. You know what they're going to believe? They're going to believe what you teach them. It is so serious that when you as a teacher stand up and teach the Bible, that you teach it correctly. Because one of these days you shall receive the greater judgment. The word condemnation is judgment. You'll receive the greater judgment. There's another set of standards. Everybody, you say, Brother Billy, everybody's on the same standard. That's not true. A deacon's not on the same standard as everybody else. A preacher's not on the same standard as everybody else. Not leaders of our church, not Sunday school teachers. They're not on the same standard of everybody. They're not like everybody else. No, they have accepted God's will and bid and, 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 and desired a position. And now as a result of taking that position, they'll have a greater judgment. Be not many masters, brethren, knowing that ye shall receive a greater judgment because you direct lives. Uh, someday uh, I understand that people is going to believe like I believe. I don't know whether you know this or not, but I want to tell you, Pastor Carpenter takes serious his preaching. I don't preach it from this pulpit something off the wall that I can't prove in my sermon. I don't do it. I don't say things and I don't, and it's not scripturally behind, backed up by this. If I tell you something, I want to tell you, you can go to the Word of God and find that it's true. Not that somebody told me that. Not that I found that out from my father or, or some grandfather somewhere. No, because it's in the Word of God. Because one day I'll give an account for the leading of this church and people and leading them. It matters to me. I dig, I dig deep before I ever preach a sermon here at this church. Ours, you ask my wife, she thinks that I've almost divorced her and I stay in my studies so much. You know, she's a lonely woman a lot of time because I'm reading and studying. Because when I get in the pulpit and I'm preaching or teaching, I want to know that what I'm sharing is comes from this blessed old book right here. And so if I do direct your life, and if you say this is what Brother Carpenter believes, it's because this book says it, not because somebody else. I, and so I'm saying the tongue, I'm using my tongue a lot. I, I talk a lot. That's not a good statement, I realize, but then needless to say I do. But the more I talk, the more I'll see judgment of it. I'll give an account. I say a lot of words, and I'm going to give account someday of it. I say, first of all, we need to use our tongue unselfishly, but secondly, we must use our tongue carefully. It's almost in the same field, it's, same, it's a go on, and James just keeps going on the same point, and it's okay, we will too. Notice for it, and, and notice verse 2. The Bible says, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and we'll get to that. And also, he bridleth the whole body. The word translated offend means to trip. It means to stumble. Uh, so for he, in many things, we stumble all, or we may uh, trip and, uh, of course, many fall into sin in this area. I think maybe we all sin if we're not careful with our tongue. 
as someone has said, the quickest way to cut your own throat is with a sharp tongue, amen or not. You know, how many of us had said something we wished a thousand times we hadn't said? Have you ever said anything got you in trouble? Needless to say, we all have. And a lot of times it gets worse. A lot of people today lose, use gossip and use a lot of other things and it brings nothing but sorrow and nothing but trouble. And gossip, dear God Almighty, uh, people does a lot of that. But anyway, let me skip a little bit. My wife watch is running fast. So let me say a couple things. We need to use our tongues carefully. Let me say first of all here, here here's where many do stumble. Many stumble, for in many things we offend all, or we uh, stumble. The word there, offend, means to stumble. It means, uh, brethren, it's easy for us to slip and to fall. And if we're not careful, if we talk a whole lot, it is a dangerous place because you'll stumble in your conversation. You'll stumble in what you say. You'll stumble uh, somewhere. Some of the great men in this day, some of the great men in yesterday have used their tongue and, and sometimes not being careful, they've stumbled. If I could, let me mention a few of them. One of those was one of the most meekest men who ever lived. His name was Moses. And the Bible says he was a humble man. The Bible says he was a meek man. I'm telling you, this is a out. In my opinion, he's one of the greatest men of the Old Testament. Uh, but Moses himself, in his words, in speaking his words, he stumbled. Because if you're not careful in something you'll do, you'll say something and you wish you hadn't. That's recorded in Psalms 106, verse 32 and 33. Listen to the word. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that he went ill with... <coughs> Oh, uh, uh, with his mouth, and because they provoked his spirit, so he spake unadvisably with his lips. Moses got upset. Moses, uh, and, and you can hardly blame the guy. I want to tell you, to be around that bunch of backslidden Baptists all that time, hear all their belly aching, hear all the complaining, I'm telling you, brother, me and Moses have been in the same boat, I guarantee you. I mean, he, he just got upset. You remember the story? I preached about it. He got over there and he got to the rock and they said, I've got to keep doing all of this, all of you all the time. And he, he smote it and he got upset. And the word of God says, he spake unadvisably with his lips. Psalms 106, 32 and 33, he really sinned. He messed up. He got angry and said more than he should. Isaiah confessed he had a problem in Isaiah 6, 5 through 6. Isaiah was a prophet. He went around saying, woe is you, over and over and over again. Read verse 5, chapter 5. He's always woeing everybody else. Chapter uh, 6, so he says, woe is me, for I am undone, verse 5 through 7. And I'm a man of unclean lips, verse 7. And he says, he laid upon my mouth a coal, and he touched my lips, and my iniquity was taken away. I said, Hallelujah. Job was a good man, but Job got himself into trouble, and he, he stumbled in Job 40 and 4. Behold, I am vile. I lay my hand upon my mouth. Wouldn't that be good sometimes to do? Has anybody ever felt like saying, sometimes? Peter stumbled in Matthew 26 and 33. Peter looked at Jesus, and he said, now, I know some of these others around here, they, they'll probably leave you and they'll probably mess up on you, but bless God, you can count on me. I will never be offended at you. And I'm afraid that that's exactly what happened. Probably the one that really I'm a little amazed at is when I think about the Apostle Paul, I guess maybe I hold him on too high of a position or a place because Paul was such a super saint sometimes to me. And I could never think that Paul and a lot of talking would stumble somewhere. But yet the Bible is still the Bible, and the Bible is the truth. And we read in the book of Acts chapter 23. I'll read the first five verses. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in good conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest Ananus commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for thou sittest in judgment against the law, and commendest thou, you, you, you smiteth contrary to the law. And they spake unto him and said, Revilest thou the high, God's high priest? Then said Paul, I, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak of 
death. And Paul stumbled and he said something he shouldn't have said. I think we all have been in that place. And sometimes we got to be careful. I think we think about being careful. I think that verse does two things for us if you look back at it. Now here we stumble often, but notice for in many things we offend all or we stumble and if any man offend not in or stumble not in word and it's in words that we do stumble the same is a perfect man and able also to bribe the whole body now really there is nobody perfect and so when the Bible uses the word perfect there I don't get you the ideal uh, that if a person is uh, come where somewhere someday in his life in this body that we're coming to a place where we're going to be perfect and we don't ever sin now, I got some bad news for you friend as long as you're in this old body you're going to have to seek God's grace and forgiveness on a daily basis but I tell you what you can do you can mature you can come to a place where you become a sound individual and we we need to be more sound more perfect more mature more complete in character we need the more ability to control our tongue i mean the sign of a spiritually mature person the sign of a sound person is the sign of a person who can control his or her tongue and doing so it's like a bridle that you can control the whole body and so sometimes maybe we need to remember that God wants us to mature and grow and so that we're sound or we're solid and we're more mature and more complete. In Psalms 39 and 1, the Bible says, I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my tongue with a bridle while the wicked is with me. I think, you know, that's a pretty good little point. I've always wanted to be be very careful about people I'm around I'm a preacher of the gospel and when I'm around wicked people they might be wicked but I want to tell you I got to be Christian I've got to watch everything that I say and all that I do because I want Jesus Christ to have a good testimony everywhere amen and so what a watch some people uh, don't watch themselves and their bad witness for God and their bad testimony and they carry on with their mouth and their tongue gets them in trouble and you're a bad witness for the Lord I tell you you're out there around the wicked you need to be sure that you leave a good light and a good witness I will take heed to my ways I'll not see my lips when I'm I'll pit my I keep my mouth and bridle while I'm the wicked is with me the Bible tells us again in Proverbs it talks about whoso keepeth his mouth or keepeth his tongue keepeth his soul and his soul from trouble you ever hear anybody say if you can't say something good about somebody what don't say nothing at all rather than say now I want to I like to share a word of testimony or just a prior request that you need to know amen if you're not careful gets into gossip don't it Sometimes you can't say something good about somebody. Probably a good thing today to not say anything at all. Amen. Let me say lastly. Notice thirdly, we talked about the tongue, taming the tongue. We've got to use it unselfishly. We've got to use it carefully. But notice quickly, we must use our tongues beneficially. Now, uh, James talks about the bits in the horse's mouth, the rudder on ships. And you know, bits, these bits and rudders, they have something in common because they both are the same reasoning. They give direction to whatever they're in and whatever they're doing. In fact, as you notice verse number 3, look at it on the screen. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. And, and that's exactly right. I mean, they, they, the bits uh, is something real small, it's sort of like we think maybe that words are sometimes. Uh, but this brings me in closing to a few thoughts. Number one is how insignificant words seem to be. Uh, seemingly, if you ever saw a piece of metal like bits that uh, look like they've really, really, really not gotten in a to do nothing, they don't look like they really 
uh, we're going to mount anything. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Just a little pair of bits that goes in a horse's mouth or, a, or whatever. You've seen them, and they don't look like they're very significant. Uh, and sometimes we think that maybe words that we say are not all that significant and not all that important. But yet those little bits that's placed inside that mouth of that horse is able to control the complete horse and to make it usable and to make it productive. And James calls our attention to some similar like insignificant is the words we use every day. The words that you say every day has power with them. I wish I could some way stop and help us to see that. I wish what you said, you, you really know uh, what, what the power it carries, how that it affects your kids, how it affects your spouse, how it affects those people you're around. Uh, you, may, you may think little about what you say, but they think a lot about what you say. And what you say, maybe they so respect you or they so think highly of you or what you say means so much to them that when you speak, you can either really bless and really help but you can direct something to where they're negative uh, and it all comes in your talk. I've seen some people talk other people right into being sick. I mean, a few times like, you know, you look bad today. You feeling okay? Yeah, you don't, you don't have any color. Next thing, you know what they're doing? You know, I am feeling a little bad. Boy, I, I am. You know what? I think I better go to the doctor. Hey, all you did was say a few words to them, and the next thing you know, the power of those words got into their mind. Are you listening to me? I want to tell you that sometimes you think they're so insignificant, but they're like the bits in the horse. They're powerful in moving people. And seeing things good, sometimes really beneficial. Uh, yeah, he can really be a blessing. A horse, well, they're pretty wild. In fact, out yonder running on the, the pasture, running in the wild, they're pretty useless. But when you get those bits and you place them in that horse's mouth, that horse can be beneficial. Whether it's pulling a plow, well, these are yesteryears, I'm sure, or whether it was working in something field or whether you're riding it to get somewhere or, or whatever you had to do, those little old bits that really wasn't very significant become so useful and so strong in making that horse do what you want it to do in a very productive and a wonderful way. That powerful animal is controlled by a small, insignificant little set of bits that you put in their mouth. And that's a lot like the tongue. The Bible says in Psalms 32 and 9, but, but be ye not as the horse or as a mule which have no understanding whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle. Amen. But quickly, notice not only how insignificant they might seem as small as bits, but notice how influential words can be in verse number 4. But also the ships uh, which though they be great are driven with fierce winds, yet are they turned by a small hemp? Now James is saying that the tongue is really influential. It does have a lot of power. The big old ship, as huge as it is, that little small rudder can change the direction of that huge ship. I saw the news the other day. Somebody went on one of them cruises, and they would to God they had never got on that one I've seen. I mean, they got in a storm big time. It looked like a wreck on that sea. And boy, they went to getting that rudder turning around really quick and getting back where they come from. I thank God they had a little rudder on there that influenced that big old ship. But what, wait a minute, what we say, what we say, you, you know, there are people who have heard you say something years ago. I Sometime I had a person talk to me the other day, and yeah, I hadn't seen him in years, and and uh, he said, you know, uh, you know, he said, yeah, Billy says, I remember when I came to church at Mountain Ash. And he says, in fact, sometimes right now, I'll be telling some of their young people something. And I'll say, and this is what Billy Carpenter said. And, and I'm not even old yet, and they're still already quoting me, you know. This is what Billy Carpenter said. And then they go, I hear people all the time, and, and, and Brother Billy says this. I had a pastor the other day, was not, well, it's been a while back now, was in a funeral together. And he said, Brother Billy, he said, you know how you do funerals? He said, I teach every one of my preacher boys to do them just like you do. And what you say is what they say. 
And I thought, you know what, you know, just, just sometimes you, 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 know, you forget about what you say sometimes. You forget about what you've said, but those words still linger on and influencing people and helping them. My, we ought to watch what we say. Your words has influence, good or otherwise. So make them good. Make them beneficial. The Bible said in Ephesians 4 and 29, wow, what happened? Read it yourself. Let's stand together. So I guess I looked down at my watch in a while, have I? Listen to me. We'll give an invitation. You may be here tonight and you say, Preacher, I need to tame my tongue. I need to know that what I say lasts a long time, lives on and on and on, and it will. You say something bad, somebody's going to remember it a long time. Hello? But you can say something good, and people can li hear it, listen to it a long time. It'll influence them. Be intentional in what you say. Be intentional to say what's right and what needs to be said and to say it the right way. If you need to come, we've got one verse. We'll give you an invite to come. One verse, and we'll be done. One verse, God's speaking. So